five, four. Ignition. Jar. My name is Gary Files and I'm the director of the Keeldra Observatory in Northumberland, the United Kingdom. And I've came here to sunny California, to Pasadena, for Space Fest 2014. And the reason I've came here is because some of the most important people in the history of space exploration have gathered here, including men who walked on the moon. Walt Cunningham is a retired American astronaut. In 1968, he was the lunar module pilot on the first manned test flight of the Apollo spacecraft on the Apollo 7 mission. He was NASA's third civilian astronaut, after Neil Armstrong and Elliot C. And during his illustrious career, he's also been a fighter pilot, physicist, entrepreneur, and venture capitalist. In October 1963, Cunningham was one of the third group of astronauts selected by NASA. On October 11, 1968, he occupied the lunar module pilot seat for the 11-day flight of Apollo 7. Well, my name is uh, Walt Cunningham, and I uh, became an astronaut with NASA in 1963, a long time ago, and I was working on a, a Ph.D. in physics at the time, and I never completed the Ph.D. in physics because I was rescued from that thesis project by going to NASA. So then I spent eight years working on flying in space, a very productive and rewarding eight years of my life. Uh, we were, well, after we uh, got through our kind of a basic training, I was assigned to the uh, what would have been the second manned space flight, uh, what we call Block 1, and as the schedule kept slipping, we ended up canceling out that one after about six or eight months. And then Wally Shira, Don Isley, and I went on to the backup crew for Apollo 1, which was still going. And after three or four months of that, the crew died in a fire on the pad, and we inherited the first mission, which was then renamed Apollo 7. And uh, uh, we ended up flying the longest, most ambitious, most successful first test flight of any new machine ever, even to this day. We were really only fearful, I would think, as I'd say, of two things. One, we were uh, fearful of failing. We did not want to be responsible for failing, and I think in those days that was reflective of the character of astronauts. You know, if this mission fails, it won't fail because of me. Uh, that was one thing. And secondly, we were aware that the public at large, and especially here, you know, in the U.S., we really wondered if NASA could survive, if there had been two failures in a row for some reason. So that we were aware of that, and we wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't go through that kind of a process again with NASA. And it's a good thing we did because it turns out to be the most successful project NASA ever had. Absolutely. When we think about the impact that the Apollo program has had on the rest of science, and of course, even when we think about the outreach that it has in insp inspiring the next generation of space travelers and space scientists, what do you think is the one really big thing that we've learned from the whole Apollo project? <clears throat> It's impossible to say what is the one really big thing that we gained from the Apollo project. Because we gained so much in so many areas, and we, what we gained was not even anticipated. Because the focus was on landing a man on the moon in this decade, and returning him safely, of course. But to do that, we had to overcome the unknowns in so many different fields, 
develop the technology to do what had never been possible before, what had never even been considered seriously before, except in fictional novels. And yet we were able to do that in five very well-planned steps to get us to the moon. Landed six times. And my personal opinion is that 500 years from now, there's only going to be one thing that they remember about the 20th century, and that is that man landed on the moon. Absolutely, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, Walt, some of the work, well, quite a lot of the work that I do back home in the UK in my profession is outreach. So it's trying to inspire the next generation of scientists. And also, I think, quite importantly, is to educate the public about what science does. What, what, what do you think is the most important aspect of space exploration moving forward in the future? And do you think it's even necessary? Well, I think that the reason that we need to keep moving forward is because to accomplish goals if we reach out far enough requires overcoming whatever the obstacles are in the way. And to do that, you have to be willing to take the risk of failure. And for example, the next frontier we have is moving outside of the uh, Earth's, not just the Earth's gravitational field, but getting away from the planet Earth and moving out to other planets. And uh, there's any number of obstacles that you, you're well aware of uh, that you have to be overcome. But the real reward we get from it is solving those problems because then they peel off into other areas of science, other areas of technology. We're living today on things that really got started back in the days of Apollo. Uh, for example, you know, any, any cell phone, any even little uh, uh, mathematical plate that you have has so much more memory than we had on the Apollo Command Module. Uh, people today don't even think in terms of kilobytes, but we had 38 kilobytes on the Apollo Command Module. And 34 kilobytes, not megabytes, 34 kilobytes were not addressable. Uh, and yet we were able to overcome the problems. So as that particular area developed, people became less uh, perceptive or less uh, 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 ambitious about overcoming those kind of obstacles. So now we can do a lot of things. But what has happened over the years is our culture and our society has changed. They've become to take for granted things that back in those days seemed impossible. Uh, we've developed a risk-averse society. So unless we have governments that are willing to explore the frontier, pay the price, take the rewards which even as, as we set out are going to be unknown, uh, we're not going to be able to do that anymore. And so there was a time back when I was still involved with Apollo and involved with NASA before I had left, I doubt if a soul in our office would have bet that we wouldn't have been on Mars by 2000. Uh, back in those days, we talked about making a, a Mars uh, flight in 1984, if you can imagine. Uh, and now we talk about doing it maybe in the 2030s. Uh, and it, it's, it's just it's just not ambitious anymore. And it's because we're, a, we're unwilling to take a risk. I also believe that when it comes to taking a risk, almost everything that, that you move forward has got some risk involved. And so I believe that there's a relationship between challenge and risk, responsibility, leadership. And so uh, unless we're willing to do that, and some of the societies and cultures around the world today are willing to take some of those risks. Unless we do that, we're not going to be able to make the kind of progress that we did in the days of Apollo. In less than an hour after touchdown in the Atlantic Ocean, the flight crew emerged from helicopters which had brought them to the recovery ship, the carrier USS Essex.
And the next manned Apollo flight can be undertaken with confidence that our brand new spacecraft is, as Commander Walter Schirra reported, a magnificent flying machine. <laughs>